Okay, good evening. Are you ready for our tutorial and teach back on the topics on the brain, the cranial nerves, the autonomic nervous system, and of course your, your sense organs. Now, when you work as future nurses, you will be encountering a lot of patients that involves the brain, spinal cord, cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and that's the reason why you need to know the anatomy of the brain and the virus cranial nerves that you find arising from the brain. Okay, we know the brain. You, you dissected the, the brain, right, in, in the lab. And when you observe the brain, you observe that the brain is not smooth. Rather, it has what? Folds and grooves, right? What do you call those folds on the surface of the brain? Gyrus. Gyrus or gyri is plural, gyrus is singular. What do you call those grooves or canal? We call sulcus or what we call sulci, if it's plural. So you will observe, therefore, the presence of this gyrus and sulcus is designed for what purpose? Why would you prefer a brain that has a sulcus and a gyrus compared to a smooth brain? What would be the advantage? Yes, anyone? Yes. To store more information. To store more information. Well, I will accept that, but how? Because if you have, so yes. Okay, there you go. Surface area is what I wanted to hear, right? You have an increased surface area. If you know your math, your physics, your geometry. The presence of the sulcus and gyrus will increase the surface area of the human brain, which makes us more, what, supposedly smarter than the rest of the kingdom animalia. We're all animals, whether we like it or not, right? You and I are animals. We belong to class mammalia. We're all mammals. But apparently, our superior intelligence is due to the fact that our brain is made up of sulci and gyri. When I was nine years old, I was already fascinated with the brain. And uh, this was, my goodness, it was 1969. You were just merely sperms and eggs by that time, right? At that time, I went to the library and, and I, I came from an American missionary school, so our books were all from the States. And I could already see the word sulcus, gyrus, and intelligence was defined by the fact that it has to do with what? Increased surface area and the fact that you're able to store more information, hopefully with a bigger surface area of the brain, right? Your brain could be as big as this room if the surface area is small because it's smooth, it's useless, right? So apparently, man has evolved upon which we can now have greater stories for more information. So you have the capacity to learn a lot. In other words, learning is unlimited, it sky's the limit. The smarter you become, the more you learn, the more smarter you become, right? So, apparently, we talk about the lobes of the brain, right? And if you remember, the lobes of the brain are correspondingly protected with the same bones that is found in the skull. For example, the frontal bone protects what lobe? The frontal lobe. What about the parietal bone? The parietal lobe. What about the occipital bone? So what about the temporal bone? So there's the, the temporal lobe of the brain. So the sphenoid bone is not have a sphenoid lobe. It's not fair to the sphenoid bone, but that's life, okay? So apparently, we also told, told you that in, in a, 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 the page in the book, it talks about structure and function, particularly with regards, what is the important role played by the frontal lobe? What is found in the frontal lobe that is important, yes? Huh? Movement, okay, why? What is found in the frontal lobe? What is, yes, Mr. Toledo? Is it the central sulcus or something else? What is found in front of the central sulcus? Huh? Precentral what? Gyrus. So the sulcus is the canal groove. The central sulcus separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So what separates the frontal from the parietal lobe? The central sulcus. So what is the name of the gyrus in front of the central sulcus? Precentral. What is the name of the gyrus behind the central sulcus? Because pre means in front, post means behind. Don't you love anatomy? You see how simple it could be? It's a matter of what? Your point of reference. 
your perception. Pre means before, after would be what? Post. What is found bef before at the front of the central circus? The pre-central judge. And this is found in what? Low. The frontal low. And where do you find the post-central gyrus? Of course, the parietal low. So therefore, if you were asked, where do you find the primary motor cortex or somatomotor cortex, where, where will it be? Precentral or post-central? Of course, the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. On the other hand, if you're going to be asked, where exactly would you find the primary somatosensory cortex, where would it be? in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. In other words, what I'm trying to show you is that our brain is highly organized. Our brain is divided into different lobes, specific functions. The pre-central gyrus, which is found in the frontal lobe, happens to be where you find the primary motor cortex. Motor means movement. Movement means muscle. Which kind of muscle? Skeletal or skeletal? <laughs> of course. That's the reason why they're considered what? Voluntary or voluntary? Voluntary. Remember, when you say skeletal muscles are, muscles are voluntary because they're controlled by what? The brain. Which part of the brain? The precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. Now, you will also notice that in the, if you cut through the coronal plane of the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe, what do you see there? You see the word homunculus in your readings? How do you spell homunculus? H O what? M O N C U. M O M U. N C U L U S. Homunculus. What is that referring to? Like a monkey, right? That, 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 that person lying down on that layer. And you can see that if you look closely there, which has greater representation, the foot or the head? Um, do you know what I'm referring to? Can anybody show me the motor homunculus? Or maybe it's what is the pathways or something? Anyway, the muscles that are found in the leg, the foot, and the face, they're all represented in that motor homunculus. Okay. And apparently, the left side of the brain controls what? The right side of the body. All the skeletal muscles on the right side are controlled by the left side of the brain. On the other hand, the right side of the brain, particularly the frontal lobe, the precentral gyrus controls what? The left side of the brain, right? Can somebody try to look for that homunculus I was referring to? Can you find that? Yes. Homunculus. So what we're trying to show, therefore, is that yeah. if you happen to have a stroke, OK? Can I take a look? There you go. See this one here? Or maybe it's in a different chapter where you have this uh, different uh, feet, head, hands, and head, and motor function. You can see that it talks about the, uh, the different pathways that controls our muscles, and in this case, the sensory pathways, right? What chapter is that? Uh, uh, that was the last chapter on the sensory pathways, right? And motor pathways. The bottom line, therefore, is that's why I was I was a little bit sad in the book because they discussed the pathways before the brain. The brain should have been discussed, then pathways should have been covered, right? So the homunculus, therefore, tells you exactly how this motor function is controlled. Most of the nerve cells or neurons would be found mostly controlling the hand and the head, and the, while the feet, and you can see that it's not as represented well. The bottom line, therefore, how is it important for me as a nurse? Well, very simple. When your patient suffer from, when your patient suffers a stroke on the left side of the brain, what gets paralyzed? Contralateral, the opposite side. Can anybody tell me why? Why would that be? Yes. Cross on the brain. What will cross? The pathways joining the body. What? What will cross? The sensory motor pathways. Look, I'm talking about motor only. I'm talking. Yeah. Not, not, I don't yeah, care about sensory right now. The motor pathways to the motor nerve fibers, like yes. they're like telephone wires. In other words, if you were to kill me today and cut through my frontal lobe, through crossing through the precentral gyrus like this, and you remove like this, okay? So 
So this is my left frontal lobe, precellular gyrus. The nerve fibers will go this way, left. And then we're like telephone wires, where do they go? They cross to the opposite side in what part of the brain? No. Medulla oblongata. And that's part of the brain stem. In other words, the nerve fiber from the left side of the brain will descend, go to the opposite side in the medulla oblongata, and then start to go down on the right side of the spinal cord. And all of them, therefore, all the spinal nerves on the right that will innervate the bicep, triceps, remember? Muscles here of the forearm and the hand, the leg, the thigh, and the foot on the right are actually controlled by what? The left frontal lobe of the brain. Why? Because the nerve fiber tracks like telephone wires, they will cross on the opposite side and then in the area of the medulla oblongata, which happens to be the last part of the human brain before you have a spinal cord. Okay? It goes down here. On the other hand, same thing happens on the right side of the brain. The right side of the brain in the motor pathways. These are, all, are they descending pathways or ascending pathways? Motor descending. descending. Motor or efferent pathways. So right side of the brain goes down on the right. Upon reaching the medulla oblongata, they will dot, cro cross to the opposite side and then they're now going to run down on the left side of the spinal cord. And it gives rise to the spinal nerves, controlling all the muscles of the left upper limb and the left lower limb. In other words, if this were a patient who suffers a stroke, a stroke is known as cerebrovascular accident. Don't worry, you'll learn this in pathophysiology with me or in core nursing. A stroke patient is a patient who's paralyzed on half of his body and this will come out in the nursing board exam and they will ask you in the nursing board exam if a patient presents with left hemiplegia hemi means half, plegia means complete paralysis h-e-m-i-p-l-e-g-i-a which part of the brain is affected? obviously the answer would be what? the right side of the brain the right cerebral hemisphere and you want to be very specific it could be the one the right frontal lobe where you have the precentral gyrus or any part of the pathway that goes down there, on the right side. So if you have paralysis on the left side, the lesion is on the right side of the brain. How can you confirm that? By doing a CT scan or an MRI scan. Who will order that? Dr. Gallo will order that. I just want to be sure. What kind of lesions am I dealing here with? Is it a blood clot that obstructed the flow of blood in the cerebral arteries? Or is it an artery in the brain called cerebral arteries that ruptured? Why? because of a severe hypertension. How many of you have grandparents here? How many of them have suffered a stroke? Like if, what kind of stroke did your grandparents suffer? I'm not sure, I was too little. You were too little, okay. Me and my dad suffered a stroke. I was what? A second year resident in my residency training. He was, as people do, what do you normally do early in the morning? You sit on the throne. Is that a game of thrones? You sit on the throne and you're going to make poo poo, right? A month before that, I, it's my dad. So I said, Dad, I love you. I don't want you to suffer a stroke in my own dialect. And I told him, one of the things that can lead to a stroke would be what? Hypertension. Your blood pressure is high. And if it's really high, what could cause the arteries to burst? You end up with intracerebral bleeding. Of course, I did not say that to my dad because he's not a medical doctor. He's an engineer. So I just, in simple terms, I said, you're, Arteries in your brain could burst, you end up with a stroke. So, to avoid this, I told him to what? High fiber diet. Why? To avoid constipation. What is high fiber? Fruits and vegetables. And in the event that you're constipated, what do you take? A stool softener or if not a what? Laxative. The most common would be milk of magnesia. You have suppositories or you can take oral medications which were over the counter. And of course, you need to walk, exercise, exercise. One month later, guess what happened? So he sat on the throne, and then he was constipated at 6 in the morning, and he did this. <gasps> what is that? Bearing down, strain, or what we call Vasalva maneuver. So apparently, his arteries ruptured because her blood pressure probably went up to 220 over 100. And because he was there by himself, he had to cook, kick the door with the stronger leg that was intact and people brought him to the emergency room. 
The bottom line was that he suffered a stroke. And what part of the body is affected? The brain. Okay? And he could have died because of that. Because when you have intracerebral bleeding, you end up, there will be accumulation of blood inside the brain. Right? Now anyway, so it's important therefore, when my dad suffered a stroke, it was on the right side of the brain, he became paralyzed on the left side. Right? That's a prime example. So we know therefore that in a patient with a motor problem, most likely it has involved the frontal lobe. On the other hand, where is the primary sensory cortex again? Post central gyrus of the parietal lobe. Everything that has to do with sensory, particularly somatic sensory, would be there. Now, what about the occipital lobe? Why is the occipital lobe important? What is the primary role of the occipital lobe? Anybody? Very smart class. It's called the visual cortex. Being the visual cortex, therefore, it is here where all the sensory inputs coming through the eye, through the visual pathways, will end up in the occipital lobe. Right? So it's called the visual cortex. What about where do you find the auditory cortex? Temporal lobe. What about gustation, taste? Still temporal lobe. So the point, therefore, is that each of these lobes have their specific functions, right? You understand. Now, the brain, if you recall, just like the spinal cord has what? The meninges, right? And these meninges, as you can see, are like in the spinal cord. After the skull, what do you have? The dura, then? Arachnoid, then? Pia matter. Which one is found on the surface of the brain, therefore? The pia matter. So what is the innermost layer? What is the middle layer? Which one is the outer layer? Which one is the toughest layer? Dura, in fact, matter means mother. Dura means tough mother. How many of you have tough mothers here? Okay. On the other hand, what about pia matter? Mother that is what? Delicate. How many of you have delicate mothers? Okay, how many of you have a combination of tough mothers sometimes and delicate mothers sometimes? I think I had that mother. Okay, my mother was tough. He would say, don't go out with guys, don't drink, don't drink. But he was very sweet. He would milk, prepare milk and call whatever I need to drink. I usually study at four in the morning when I was nine years old. And she would, she would sacrifice by waking up at four just to what? Prepare my, I used to, uh, you know, chocolate drink called Milo and very delicate. Milo. I drink, I drink, study. Why would I study early in the morning? Why do you say I study at four in the morning? There was no destruction. I could study well, why? Because there was nothing that could distract me, right? So apparently what happened was, this would allow me to, every time I read the book, I could actually see the words, what? Jumping and say, take me, take me, okay? And then I would learn from that. So apparently, we, we learn because of all these things. We learn all about the, the different lobes of the brain. At the same time, we think of it in terms of knowing what specific areas of the brain are for what, for function, right? So dura, arachnoid, pia. Now, the dura and the arachnoid and the pia, what do you call the space above the dura? Epidural. Epidural space. What do you call the space below the dura? Subdural space, right? And apparently, you know what the word hematoma means? Yeah. Accumulation of blood due to traumatic brain injury. You fall on the floor, you end up with brain. You have a car accident, you can have. Which do you think is more dangerous? Epidural hematoma or subdural? Subdural? Do you agree to that? How many of you says subdural? Okay. How many of you says epidural? I see one hand, I see two hands. Okay, three hands. Okay. Why did you say epidural is more dangerous? Because it's an arterial bleed where the other one is a venous bleed. Where did you learn that? In the book. book. <laughs> Absolutely right. You have to relieve the pressure. Okay. So can you repeat what you just said? Um, that the epidural is from an artery where the subdural is from a vein. So it's a different type of bleed. So which one is more dangerous? The epidural. Because it's arterial. Can you tell me why? Because it has um, the... You give her a chance to speak. You answered some doodle, so... <laughs> it's because um, it's moving the oxygen towards the brain. Is it the risk? Okay, now it's your chance. Oh, because the arterial has a high blood pressure than higher... Than Precisely. Than so see, you got the right answer, but the right explanation is that in the arteries, you have what? Higher... 
Higher. Higher. Okay, let's do an experiment tonight. Go home, get a blade. <laughs> cut your arteries and cut your veins. I'm not, I'm serious, eh? <laughs> Joking, of course. How many, uh, how many hours are you going to I'm not kidding. I, I used to joke about this, but I, I know some people with Dr. Gamo, you do not have empathy. Uh, this is just a joke, okay? Please, joke. So one time, a, a person, I don't want to say woman, because they might say discrimination, a woman or a man, was depressed because the husband had an affair. Oh, that's it's already, it's a woman already. <laughs> and <laughs> it's the part of the joke, okay. So the woman was in, this is, if I were a, if I were to be like Tarantino, you know, this uh, guy who directs movies, I would have a, a woman in a bathtub crying, sobbing, ooh, ooh, ooh. my husband doesn't love me anymore, blah, 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 and she gets a blade. Unfortunately, she was not a student in my class, and what she did, what she did was to cut what? The vein. See these veins here? Small veins. So she cut the veins, and then after three hours, she was surprised. What the heck? How come I'm still alive? You didn't find out. Okay, obviously she cut the wrong blood vessel, right? So after what, three hours, the husband kicked the door. Honey! Um, they live happily ever after, you know, I guess. The girl was saved. The bottom line, therefore, is the reason why it's more dangerous because you are right, it's arterial, but you have to know the reason why. Arterial bleeding is more dangerous because when you cut an artery, guess what? It's a fountain of blood. A vein? No wonder you're still alive after three, three hours. Oh my gosh! So, in fact, I have, I have practiced for 12 years before I migrated here. An old man fell on the nursing home, and then he stands up, he's okay, he's fine, he's smiling, and then six months later, you do a CT scan, there is an old subdural hematoma. But he didn't die, how come? The bleeding was so slow, it took six months for it to become seen on a CT scan. On the other hand, my cousin, he was 19 years old, he was driving a motorcycle, no helmet, he took some beer, fell, lost his balance, fell, and the hospital was just, let's say, 500 feet away, or a few meters away. He walked towards the emergency room of the hospital, told the nurse, I fell, I have a severe headache, he had projectile vomit. After 10 minutes, passed out, became comatose. So my cousin sustained what? Epidural, Epidural hematoma. Unfortunately, it was in 1988, there was no CT scan, no, no MRI scan. So the doctors who admitted him did not know what to do. Now, at that time, he was the son of the governor of our province, and they didn't want to touch him because why? If he dies in the operating room, he'll be in deep shit or trouble, right? In fact, what they could have just done, with, even though there was no CT scan, you go to Home Depot, <laughs> in the Philippines, there's no Home Depot, but they go to a, a, a store where you can buy a drill. And all they did was what? Drill here, drill here, drill here, drill, and then what? The Let the blood come out. By draining, you would what? Decrease the intracranial pressure. There's the danger of epidural bleeding. Epidural arterial bleeding, you've involved the meningeal artery. Isn't it amazing? What's the name of the artery in the meninges? Meningeal. What's the name of the veins? Meningeal veins. Don't you love anatomy? I love anatomy. <laughs> but the sad story is that because nobody touched him, and then it so happened that my, my aunt and uncle forgot that he had a nephew who was based in residency training, and then two days later they called me, oh my God, my your cousin fell, blah, blah, blah. So I brought a neurosurgeon there. To cut the story short, the blood no longer went up. There was no CT scan, what can you do? You can actually insert a dye, it's called the white radio-opaque dye here in the carotid arteries. And then normally if there is blood flow, what happens is that you insert the dye here, the dye will be what? Going to the blood arteries in the brain, like a tree, and you take an x-ray. And it's called an angiogram with the use of an x-ray. In fact, CT scan is a sophisticated x-ray. I hope you, don't, you, know, you know that. A CT scan is, a, even though you do not have a CT scan, and if a country you go to does not have a CT scan, all you need to do is insert the dye, and the dye will flow to the arteries of the brain, and that's an x-ray. And you can see the white flow of blood. 
In the case of my cousin, the blood did not go into the brain because there was so much what, increased intracranial pressure, there was so much brain swelling, right? And what happens if your brain is swollen and it has increased intracranial pressure? This is the skull, the skull is hard, the brain is soft. There's an opening called the foramen magnum. What happens to the brain? It pushes down, it's called brain herniate, herniation, like this herniation. H-E-R-N-I-A-T-I-O-N. Is that bad or is it very bad? The moment the brain herniates, now remember what I said a while ago, what we call the lowest part of the brain? Medulla oblongata. Above is the medulla, below the spinal cord. If this were the spinal cord, if this were the medulla here, where my ulnar styloid is, this medulla, spinal cord, this is the foramen magnum, right? Made of skull, of sips of bone. If the brain herniates, what will the foramen magnum do to the medulla oblongata? Squeeze it, compress it. And the moment you compress the medulla oblongata, what is the primary function of the medulla? Huh? It's the breathing or respiratory center. And what happens if you compress or squeeze the medulla oblongata, which happens to be the respiratory center? You will stop and you will, you will rest in six feet under the permanent resident at forest. So what is it that we should avoid? Brain herniation. How do you prevent that? By drilling A, drilling A, to make the blood get out and be drained, to decrease the intracranial pressure. And that's precisely the reason how, why I always bring an electrical drill with me. <laughs> I'm not joking. Even now, if anybody here, God forbid, will fall and sustain an epidural bleeding, I'll be there, ready to drill a hole. How many of you watched that episode on Grace Anatomy? So that part where that what's the name of the blonde lady? Yeah. Did you see the Uzi, Easy, or what? Which one? The, the, the episode. Who, who who did the drilling? Dr. Gray. That's oh, different. Airplane? That's different. That's different. That's different. Uh, I'm talking about the Grace Anatomy episode where the with the the woman. What's the name of that intern? Easy is Uzi is. Is okay. There was an episode whereby, like two or three years ago, there was an explosion in, I think, in the port or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and this, this African-American guy <laughs> could not be brought to the hospital because there was this big, big, big chunk of metal and concrete on top of him. So this intern, easy, was asked, go there, take, take a look at all the patients. And when she spoke to this guy, how are you, sir? What's your name? Where do you live? Blah, blah, blah. She was still awake and alert. But let's say five or ten minutes later, he became what? Drowsy. That is the reason why whenever a person has sudden deterioration in the level of consciousness, could you consider a possible traumatic brain injury? So what did, what did this easy do? What did she do? Anybody with an electrical drill, right? And then I think they just boiled the drill, and then she got the drill, and, went, shh, shh, shh. and guess what? The guy woke up. Did he save the life of that person? Yes, to buy time, right? Because there was no way that they could bring him right away. So whenever I go to Big Bear, I always bring a drill with me too, okay? <laughs> God forbid, my family might end up with traumatic brain injury. I'm ready, okay? Now, so subdural is not as da the dangerous. It's going to be venous bleeding. Therefore, the, the fact that it's venous, it takes time. They don't die. Now, okay, so we talked about the meninges. What do you find in the subarachnoid space? What? Cerebrospinal fluid. Now what part produces the cerebrospinal fluid? Yes? What produces the cerebrospinal fluid? The ventricles produce CSF? What are ventricles, by the way? This came out in your midterm exam, augmented reality. What is a ventricle? Chamber. Huh? A chamber. It's a space. So can that chamber produce the CSF? No. Or is it the chamber that contains the CSF? Very good. So think, I want my students to be analytical thinkers. I want my students to be critical thinkers. The ventricles are spaces or chambers that where you can find the cerebrospinal fluid. 
But what exactly produces the CSF? Huh? Of course. Choroid plexus. Now, what is a choroid plexus supporting, right? What? What is it? The answer is correct again. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> I was gave me the right answer, arteries versus veins. Now I'm asking you, you got give me the right answer, you have to tell me what it is. So that is what you call deep learning. Deep learning is not just knowing the answer, but knowing why, how, where, what. Huh? So what is a cord plexus? It's composed of epidemic cells and permeable capillaries. So what's a capillary, my dear? Huh? What's a capillary? Shh. You see what I mean? How do you develop deep learning? How? It's a small artery. I see the small artery is a small blood vessel. Of course. It's the smallest blood vessel in the world. So if it's a blood vessel, what is found inside the blood vessel? Don't show Micah, don't show anatomy. to me. My, 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 what do you call it? My hair is standing. Because of my, my love for anatomy. Mm. What's thought inside the blood vessel? Hmm? Blood? It's a blood vessel. What kind of blood vessel? Smallest? And what's thought inside here? Blood. Blood is made of what? Blood cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelet, and what else? Plasma. And what is this plasma mainly, mostly made of? Now, what do you think the cord plexus do? So you also have ependymal cells. So this two make, produce the CSF. So what do you think, remember, have you ever remembered, do you remember where did we discuss about ependymal cells? Was it, when was it discussed, yes? Ependymal cells. Have you ever heard of that ependymal cells? Who yes. talked about that? Was it me? Was it last week before the final midterm exam? What do ependymal cells produce? What kind of cells? Are they neurons or neuroglial cells? CNS or PNS? CNS. You don't need my reaction in my face. I failed my friend. He gave me the wrong answer. It should have been central nervous system. In the PNS, there were only two, satellite and what? There's van cells. While in the central nervous system, it talked about astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, remember? Including this one, right? You understand, you remember that? So what you have learned in the past, you should never forget. That's how you become smarter. What happens if you learn last week, you just forget now that it's not learning? And you will, be, you will have a difficult time going into physiology and also physiology, okay? Anyway, where do you find the scoric plexus and epidermal cells? Where are they found? What? Where? Of course, where? In the wall of the ventricles, right? In the wall of the ventricles, you find the scoric plexus. See? Can I show that? That's precisely the reason why, when you look at all these diagrams here, each ventricle has that red thing. Why is that red? Because it has the blood vessel that is found in the blood vessel called capillaries, right? So, in simple terms, what does the capillary do? It filters the blood, removes the water, and converts that into what? CSF. So what does the choroid plexus do? Filters the blood, removes the plasma, which contains water, and that becomes what? The cerebrospinal fluid. So, in terms of the ventricles of the brain, let's start with the topmost. What is the name of that ventricle? Lateral ventricles. How many are there? Two. Left two. and right. And then it passes where? Interventricular foramen of what? Monroe. Right? And what comes after the interventricular foramen of Monroe? Hmm? Of course! And then where does it go next? 
The cerebral aqueduct of Celsius. And then finally where? And what happens after the fourth ventricle? It doesn't, where does it go? In fact, there is, I think, a, di a diagram there, right? Where does it go? Huh? Well, some of them will go to the central canal, but where else? Huh? Before going to the subarachnoid space, did you encounter the word aperture? Lateral. Okay, Mr. Toledo, tell us, please, inform us, enlighten us. What? It's the lateral. And? What is the opposite of lateral? Lateral aperture. Lateral and what? Median. Is that in the book? Did you ever read the book? Hmm? Lateral, median aperture. Is it there? Okay, it goes where? Lateral and what? Medium. So, which one is two? Lateral or lateral? Lateral. Right and left. Median means only one in the middle. Do you know what the word aperture means? Opening. A passageway. Similar to foramen. But you talk about foramen not in this context, rather you use the word apertures. Where do you think will this go? From the apertures, it will go where? Subarachnoid sub space. Mm -hmm. So from here it goes where? Subarachnoid. Subarachnoid space. So have you heard, have you seen the word aperture in your book? Yeah, yeah. What page is that, my dear? 413. 413. 413. So she has pointed out the word aperture there. Yeah, not oh my god, it's actually here. You need an aperture. And there's also the word what? Lateral aperture there, right? And then the central canal. The bottom line, therefore, is this. From these apertures and opening, the CSF will flow from top going downwards. Why? Why do you think this will be the case? So do you notice the arrow going down? Because of the effect of what? Gravity. Who said gravity? Perfect, my friend. You, are you good in physics? OK, you might be. OK, I'm not saying you are, but you are. You seem to be laughing and smiling. So. By gravitational pull, it goes down, goes into the subarachnoid where? Around the brain. Remember? Dura, arachnoid, PM. Around, in the subarachnoid space, what happens next? Is there, should, should it remain there in the subarachnoid space? So what do you think should we do with this CSF there? Huh? Do you know that in one day you produce how many CSF, how many ml? It's around 500 ml. Can you imagine every day 500 ml, the fallet, 521,000, so should it stay there or should it be drained? Okay, who do you think will drain this? Hmm? They are now in the subarachnoid space, no, no more ventricles, but there. This is really inside the middle portion of the brain. It's now up here. What's the answer to my question? What will drain the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space? Well, I want you to Google that. Give me the answer in five seconds. Yes? Subarachnoid granulation. Granulation, but what part of the subarachnoid granulation? It begins with letter V as in victory. Who said that? What's your name? Huh? What is your name? How come you gave me the right answer? I saw your study guide. Oh shit! <laughs> did I give a study guide? Yeah. yeah. I did. Oh my god! Can you imagine if you just answered the study guide, you can actually get a perfect score in these quizzes? Did you answer? Oh, can, can, I, can you show me your study guide? Come on. This is cheating before the exam, right? So, I have never. I normally don't give study guides for the past ten years. But with the blended learning, I had to do it because people, oh my God, Dr. Gamo, I'm overwhelmed. What will I do now? I hear. Okay. Okay. So, uh, come on. Oh, I want to go on the camera? Oh, oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so where is it? Right here. Well, who gave you the study guide? You did. I did? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay, what did you do? Why, why, is, this, why is this red and red is blue? 
because I'm writing what you're telling me right now. Oh, you're right. It's only now. Oh, Talk about no, your no, notes. That's extra information. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so where is that Arabian villa that you're talking about? Right here. So can you please read what is that? Number 11, what is that? Arabian villa. Then, granulations. granulations. And then, of course, what, did that, what does it say here? I wrote what they are. Small protrusions. Okay, very good. So is the villa, begin with letter V, let's give him a big hand. So, do not disappoint me. I hope you get a perfect score today. Maybe one or two too. mistakes. Well, good luck, my friend. Good luck. Thank you. In the force be with you. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? I gave you everything to study, and you're supposed to know these things by now, right? Because it's all there, my God. <laughs> so where do you think you find the arachnoid villi? In the arachnoid granulations. And where do you think you find the arachnoid granulations? Right. In the arachnoid. <laughs> Remember Dura? Arachnoid Pia. So on the wall of the arachnoid are the granulations which contains the villi. And what do the villi do? Look at my mouth. So they're going to suck what? Blood or CSF? And where do you think will this CSF go once the arachnoid villi go? So now, the so learning is not limited to this. Now, who knows the answer? Where do you think the CSF being drained by the arachnoid villi? The answer is correct. It's drained by the villi. That means it's everywhere here, right? In, in the subarachnoid space, in the wall of the arachnoid, you have the granulations with the villi, and the villi will what? Drain, remove. Remove by. And where does it bring it to? Hmm? Yes? Somebody said something. Spinal. Wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm, 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 I'm limited to that. Where? Yeah, yeah, I can see it somewhere there. What page is that? Four, one, zero. This one here, look for something there. It is made of two words. One word begins with letter V as in victory. The second word begins with letter S. Cerebral brain. Huh? V and S. What do you think the V stands for? She said it right. Venus. What about the S? What is S? S. Give me an S. Huh? Huh? Uh, what page is that? What is a word that begins with S and ends with S? Sinus! <laughs> okay. Remember? Sagittal sinus? Remember the word? Remember the one that you see here? Sagittal plane? Superior sagittal sinus? Now, these are called venous sinuses. So, where do you think? The CSF in the venous sinuses going to be brought, brought to. Venous sinuses. Venous sinuses. Huh? Of course! And what is a vein, my friend? It's a, is it a blood vessel? Yeah. So the arachnoid villi will drain. The CSF, this is the opposite of produce. This will produce the CSF. This will drain the arachnoid villi. Where does it bring it to? Where does it go? The, the dural venous sinuses. And what is a sinus? A sinus, again, like your sinus in here, air space. But here it's what? A space that contains what? CSF? So from the arachnoid villa, the CSF is brought to the venous sinuses, and the dural venous sinuses will bring it where? To the, the veins. So what that, how it happens to the CSF, that's water, goes back where? The to the blood circulation. Is this a process of recycling? Yes. Don't you feel so good? 
Our body is a big recycling plant. Wow, amazing. Blood, blood cells, red blood cells, water. Goes back, so what came from the blood goes back where? The blood in the veins of the brain. Now what happens if you have meningitis? The arachnoid dura and pia are inflamed. Will this arachnoid in meningitis be able to drain the CSF? That's the reason why you develop what? Eyes, eyes, nose, baby. What do you call that? I know what? An infant wherein the sutures have not fused yet. You develop hydrocephalus. Hydro means water because CSF is mostly water. What I'm trying to show here in class is that the knowledge that you acquire from this lecture today will be in preparation for pathophysiology and coronary And You might think, do I need to know it now? I'm just trying to show you that if you know your anatomy and physiology, there is nothing that you cannot answer in nursing or in fact medicine or your nursing board exam. And now what do we do with these patients? Have you ever seen those babies with big heads? We put a shunt, we drain one. Excess fluid in the lateral ventricle under the skin and go into what, the peritoneal cavity, which is sterile. So VP shunt, ventricular what? Peritoneal shunt to save the brain of that baby. We do the same thing for adults, by the way. You can either perform a ventricular colostomy or what, okay? Now, let's move on to another topic. We talk about cranial nerves. Oh, no, with the brain. Let's go back to the brain. In the brain, you have the diencephalon made up of what? Epithalamus. Okay, you're raising your hand. Give me the answer. Okay, what does epi mean? Above, what does hypo mean? How, how come you know the answer? <laughs> okay, study guide again. I love, I love a study guide then, huh? Because it's basically the things you're expected to know and get a perfect score in the quizzes, right? So if you just answer the study guide from quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, by now your average will be 99%. How do I know that? Because I made a study guide. I'm a man of numbers. If the student just answers and prepares the study guide, and not just prepare the study, but retain the information that you have done, Okay, let's go back. You said what? Diencephalon, you have what? Without looking at your notes, you said what? Epithalamus. Thalamus. Hypothalamus. Very good. Is the answer correct? Is that in your study guide? Are you using your own or you're copying from, her, from him, your neighbor? That's actually my study guide. Ah, that was your study guide? My God. <laughs> you're sharing study guides then. Right. You're good friends? Yeah. Okay. I don't have to ask any more, further money. I might be in trouble. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, are you more than friends? <laughs> okay, so. Because your answer gave me the right answer. What is your name? Uh, Come on. Tell me. What is found in the epithalamus? Huh? Pineal gland. And what does the pineal gland secrete? What hormone? Melatonin, very good. And what's it do? Calming, huh? Does it help like with calming? Calming? Yes, anybody? Yes? What? Yes, Mr. Toledo. Circadian rhythm. What is exactly circadian rhythm? Sleeping and waking patterns. You sleep at night, you wake up in the morning. Sleep at 10, wake up at 6. Wake up, sleep at 10, wake up at 6. It patterns, it's a pattern. With or without the alarm clock, you wake up. Thank you, melatonin. You made my day. <laughs> what about the thalamus? Why is the thalamus so important? Miss the Garcia sisters over here, they're very quiet. Sandy and Kimberly. What is the role of the thalamus? Is that in the, uh, in the uh, study guide? You, you have to say, I, I gave everybody a study guide. You might think I only gave it to these two people here, right? I gave it to everyone, right? Yeah. Okay, what, what, did you, what did you find about the, uh, the thalamus? Why is the thalamus so important in here? Okay, what about sensory information? What's the key word there that begins with letter R? Relay. Relay. 
Oh my God, you're so fast. Relay. Do you understand what it means? Then explain to me, what is relay? It figures out where to send the information. Of course, it's like a border guard patrol there, you know? Do you have an ID with you? Okay, are you a US citizen? So th this guard will tell you where to go. Oh, you have to do with what? Sensory for vision, you go to the occipital lobe. Hey, you, you go to the parietal lobe. Hey, you, you go to the what? For hearing. So it's a relay station, isn't it amazing? Relay station, thalamus. Now, what about the hypothalamus? Give me anybody. Yes? Arguments, emotions. Mm. Emotions, what else? It's actually, for me, it's an amazing area. Emotions, what else? Okay, most importantly, it's the what? It is for regard to hormone. It's the, the master of the master gland. Who is the master gland before? Pituitary gland. Who is now the master of the pituitary gland? Hypothalamus. Why? Because it releases what we call releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. Are we going to study that next week? Yes, we are. The hypothalamus is the master of the master gland. It controls the pituitary gland. And it talks about what? What else? Visceral control. What do you mean by visceral control? To some extent, yes. Is it also where it regulates your appetite? Whether you're hungry or not, it's called the satiety center. In fact, if you want to lose weight, a lot of drugs are able to control this hypothalamus. So that you can become what? Thinner. In what way? Because your brain will say, hey, I'm already full with one teaspoon of food. So many of these drugs will now affect the hypothalamus because why? It controls your what? Appetite center. It's your satiety center. What else? What's more important among nurses? Especially if the patient is febrile and with high blood temperature. Huh? Of course, temperature regulation. In fact, one of the questions in the nursing board exam was, a patient was admitted upon admission, the patient pattern was going up and down the temperature. And the question was, what part of the brain is affected? The answer is? The answer is? Can you imagine that? It came out in the nursing board exam. Is there any question that you couldn't answer? None. If you know your anatomy and physiology, because if you know what is normal, then you know what is what? Abnormal. Okay? Now, what part of the brain is for emotions? Huh? Aside from, yes? What is considered the emotional brain? Hmm? Yes? I'm not sure if I put that in the uh, study guide, but does anybody know? Is it amygdala? Huh? Amygdala? Well, that's part of it. What did you call the T in general? Limbic system. There you go. The limbic system is the emotional brain. Limbic. In fact, how often do we tell people on Valentine's Day, honey, I love you with all my heart. That's stupid. Why? Because the heart is nothing else but a pump. So when you tell somebody, honey, I love you with all my heart, honey, I love you with all my muscular pump. <laughs> Why do you love it, true? Don't you ever say, honey, I love you with all my heart, because that's the most stupid thing to say. Because the heart has nothing to do with the feeling of love or emotional it's called what? The limbic system. Honey, I love you with all my limbic system. <laughs> and that is definitely anatomically, physiologically correct. Every time I greet my wife, honey, I love you with all my limbic system. <laughs> the first time I laid my eyes on my wife, she was working in the lab. I was a fourth year medical student. I opened the door. I was being specimens of urine and so forth culture. She was there, a ray of sunlight shone on her back. And I told her, we miss where do I put the specimens of urine and stool? The ray of sunlight went to her face. She was such a beautiful face. <gasps> she smiled and said, just leave it there. <laughs> and all I can say was, thank you. <laughs> and then my heart started to what? But was it the heart? It was what? First the eye. <laughs> it was love at first sight. The eye went to the limbic system and say, you like her, huh? <laughs> I went back to the hospital. I told my classmates, there were 10 of us in med school. You have 10 people going to surgery or OB or space. Anyway, I was in internal med. 
I told my classmates, in life you make things happen, you do not wait for things to happen. So what did I tell my classmates? I, I said, I told them, from now on, I will be the one to deliver all the specimens. <laughs> <laughs> of urine and stool. <laughs> yes. Next thing I did was, one of the interns came from the same place I came from. I told what's the name, what's the phone number of that lady there, the pretty one? Ethel, phone number. I called my, I called Ethel on the phone, I, and I kept on delivering specimen right after a week, and I said, hi, Ethel, do you remember me? I'm the one who kept on bringing the specimens. And she goes, I don't. <laughs> that means it only means one thing. I'm not as good looking as Brad Pitt. <laughs> so I was persistent. That's what you get, persistence, right? It's now my wife of 30 years. But was it the heart or was it the limbic system? The limbic system, very good. Okay, now. How many cranial nerves do we have? Well, so what's cranial nerve number one? Olfactory well, sense of? No. So if anybody who farts in this room, can I tell? <laughs> I can tell, yes, yes, you, okay. Number two? Optic, Optic nerve. Sense of? Sight, right? Vision, right? Number three? Oculomotor. Oculomotor. Um, what is four? To all clear, what about, let's jump to six. Abducens, right? So these three are the cranial nerves for the eye muscles. Three, four, and six. Six is important for what? <coughs> Lateral rectus. Abducens. <coughs> Remember? <coughs> In the model of the eye. What about your <coughs> to all clear? Four. Superior oblique. So six minus two, the remaining four muscles would be what? Oculomotor. What would this be? Superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique. You should memorize that because part of your thing that you do as a nurse is to do what? A physical neurological assessment of your patients. You want to know if there is what? Lazy eye, you know? Now what about five? What is five? Trigeminal nerve. There are three branches. One branch goes to the what? Eye, ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch, and then what? Mandibular branch. If you have a toothache involving what? The lower teeth, what is the involved? The mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So what are the three branches? Ophthalmic branch, V1, V2, maxillary, and that's V for V for Roman numeral five for trigeminal, right? V3 is what? Maxillary, mandibular branch. So that's the one responsible for your toothache. Now, what else? If somebody touches your face, what kind of nerve is involved there? Oh, sharks, wrong answer. Wrong answer. It's not seven, it's not facial nerve. What is it? Time driven on nerve, you're the man. See? Sensory, sense of faith, touch. V1, V2, V3. Do you understand? Now, what about seven? Seven is for what? Facial muscles. Not the facial sensation. You see the big difference? The muscles of the face for what? Facial expression would be a seven. Facial, what else? Anterior two thirds of the tongue. Sensation of taste, anterior two thirds of the tongue. What about the posterior one third of the tongue? Nine. And what is nine? Glossopharyngeal nerve. And what about the base of the tongue? 10. Vegas. In other words, how do you remember this? Put number seven where? In front. Then what? Nine, then what? Okay, what's the volunteer? Come here. <laughs> you! Come on! No, I'm just joking. And then every time you're taking the quiz, all you need to do is extend your tongue. Oh, I see number seven. Anterior two third bar. Answer is facial nerve seven. Posterior one third? Nine. Glossopharyngeal nerve. And the base of the tongue is what? Vegas ten. Vegas. Okay, what is eight four? Vestibular cochlear nerve. What is vestibular? Sense of hearing and balance or coordination, right? What about your nine? We talked about that. That is what? Posterior one third of the sensation, but certain muscles of the tongue, right? What about ten? Vagus. Vagus is part of what? Parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. So therefore, it's important for what? It's the longest cranial nerve. Why? Because it extends from the medulla all the way to the heart, the lungs, the GI tract. In other words, the vagus nerve is so important. It's the longest cranial nerve, part of parasympathetic. What does it do, the vagus nerve, what does it do to the heart rate? Slow it down. 
What about the lungs? Bronchoconstriction, the opposite of bronchodilation. What about stomach acid secretion? More acid secretion to rest and digest. What about the peristalsis? More peristalsis for digestion. So is that important to know? Yes, that's the reason why, what do doctors do? If you have hyperacidity with bleeding stomach ulcers, are we going to surgically cut the vagus nerve going to the stomach? Yes, we do. It's called vagotomy. Have you heard of the word vagotomy? So vagotomy is cutting the vagus nerve because what does the vagus nerve do? It makes the stomach produce more what? And why is it if you have hyperacidity, is that bad for you? It can lead to stomach what? Ulcers? Can it bleed? Yes. Can you bleed to death? So in severe cases, the surgeon will have to cut the vagus nerve, okay? Now what about 11? Accessory. Accessory nerve, it innervates what muscle? Trapecius and sternocleidomastoid, right? And what about 12? Hypoglossal, glossal tongue, it moves the tongue muscles. Like if I extend my tongue, ah, 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 hypoglossal, right? Okay? Now, Make sure you know these cranial nerves and their functions, right? Now, autonomic, very simple. All you need to do is separate what? Sympathetic versus what? Parasympathetic. In other words, you don't have to know all the diagrams there. Autonomic <coughs> divided into what? Sympathetic. And then what? Sympathetic and then what? So which among the two is important for survival? Fright. Flight. Okay. Stress response. Sympathetic. So for survival, in order to survive, fright and flight. What do you mean by flight? Run away. If this building is on fire, are we going to run away? The only problem is only one one. So what do you think will happen? We'll all be fighting each other just to be the first one to get out. <laughs> Who do you think will be the first to get out? You. Of course, maybe me. <laughs> I have three kids, I have a wife. I don't care who you are. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Of course, I'm the teacher. I'll be the last person to get out. I'll be the first one to die. You're my student, so go ahead. Go. And I'll just stay here. <laughs> I want to die. <laughs> Who wants to die? Nobody, right? So when my sympathetic will kick in, the first thing I'll do is that everybody, leave your stuff, get out! And I'll be the last one. It happened to me one time in the lab. And not to be lab, this happened two years ago. Professor Mark told us about it. Huh? Did Dr. Mark? Oh my God, did he? Really? It was so stupid of me. So I was doing a lecture, right? So I was in the middle of, I think we're about to end, and I was trying to summarize, I said, and all of a sudden, it was around 11.30, and I could see the smoke coming from the ceiling. So I used my chemistry background. I said, okay, oh my God, it's a very good chemical phenomenon. <laughs> the air is light. <laughs> it's floating in the air. It's the smoke. And then, oh, okay, so you can see the, the, uh, the, the separation of the molecules, of gas molecules, and you know. <laughs> and then, and once, so it's, in, his, in a very simple way, Dr. Gamma, remember, if there's smoke, there must be fire. Oh, sh oh you're right. <laughs> And believe me, in 30 seconds, the alarm came up. Shh. And okay, everybody get up, leave your butt, leave everything. Everybody left. What did I do? I went to my room to get my laptop. <laughs> Am I stupid? I was stupid. Why, because everything was in that laptop, all my lectures. Because I did not know about this Google, Google Drive, you know, the, you know this uh, cloud, cloud thing. So everything was there. In my back, and my back contains all the, the what do you call that thing? The, all my desk and all these things. So, so I said to them, I saw Dr. Moore coming out of the faculty room. I was going in. <laughs> in fact, you should be going out because you want to save your life. I said, I don't care. I will save my back first before saving my life. <laughs> it turned out there was really fire there in that uh, second floor. So next time there's smoke, remind me it's fire, Dr. Gamo. So what do you think happened to my pupils? Delay, so that you can see where the fire exit is, right? What else? What about your bronco what? Dilate. Why? To open up the airways, you get more oxygen to the brain, right? What happens to the heart? It creates heart rate or tachycardia. Why? You want to pump more blood when? To the muscles of what? The thigh, the leg, and the foot. You can run away. 
You also want more blood to where? To the brain, to the heart, to the lungs, and vital organs. Do you want more blood to the skin? No. So it will divert. It will tell the skin, sorry, Mr. Skin. Next time, what is a priority now is what? The muscles of the leg, the thigh, and the foot, so that this guy can run, and then what? Why do you want more blood to the brain? So they can think clearly. I am on the second floor. Which one will I use, elevator or stairs? Yes. Of course. So that's why it's important to have more blood supply to the brain, the muscles, and the lungs, right? What else? What about peristalsis? Peristalsis is what? High or low? No. Why? Because there's no time to make poo-poo? How oh, can you imagine, Dr. Gama, can I stay for a while? I want to make poo-poo. I want to go to the restroom. No. In other words, in a sympathetic response, you will be constipated because there is no time to make poo-poo. Your peristalsis will be decreased. What about the bladder muscles? The detrusor or bladder, urinary bladder muscles, what there happens? Will they contract or relax? Contract or relax? Okay, she said contract, so can you imagine if it contracted, you are making wee wee as you go down the stairs, no. <laughs> and all of us will die because all of us will slide. <laughs> and I'm just kidding. The answer is what? It will relax. Why do you want the muscles in the bladder wall to relax? So they can store the urine temporarily, but the sphincters must be tight, which is skeletal, external. Control to that. Because you have no time to make wee wee. So your bladder muscles must relax. And then after one hour, you go and look for the nearest McDonald's. Uh, if there's time, you can say, meet me with them on the side wall of the parking space. And, and somebody said, Dr. Gama, what about using that urine to kill the fire? <laughs> Only for men, though. <laughs> Joke only, OK. So everything here will be what? Opposite. 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 Now, what is amazing here is this. When you think of pharmacology, you think of drugs, those drugs will affect all of these. Example, if I tell the nurse, give the patient a bronchodilator, what is the neurotransmitter here? Adrenaline. Adrenaline or noradrenaline and epinephrine. It's another name is what? Epi, right? If your patient has a wheezing, what is wheezing? <laughs> What happens is that the smooth muscles in the bronchioles are what? Contracting in spasm, bronchospasm. There's narrowing of the airways in a patient who's having an asthmatic attack. <laughs> is he having a good time? He could die. So what do you think we'll give the patient? Epi, the form of what? EpiPen, or before that, I can give what? Inhaler. And what is that inhaler going to do? Relax the smooth muscles, causing bronchial dilation. How many of you are asthmatic here? Okay, those who raise their hand, how many of you have your inhalers now with you? Can okay, show me your inhaler? Okay, the two of you? You did not raise your hand, you have, did you not bring your inhaler? No, no. Oh, it ran out. So where is it now? Huh? I ran out. I don't have any more. So if you have an attack now, what happens? Can I borrow your inhaler? Ah, there you go. <laughs> so let me see, what is yours? I don't have it. Shit, you die, you die, you will be alive. I'm just joking, of course. She will then just, after one puff, give it to her, one puff, give it to him. Right? The, you have one, okay. Can I borrow one? What's that? Ter, uh, terbutalin, albuterol? You don't even know? You still have to read, okay? You should know. It's okay. Now, some people say, Where is it? In my car. I said, if you are in the second floor, how long will it take for you to run to the park? And you're going like this. <laughs> By the time you reach your car, you'll be out of breath, you'll die. Do you know how long will it take you to become brain dead? Four minutes? How long will it take you to run from the second floor to the car? Five minutes? <laughs> By the time you reach the door, you collapse. <laughs> we call 911. Too late. So you always have that inhaler with you. It's Diaz, right? Brandy, if you're my daughter, I will always have uh, every, every minute you have your inhaler with you. <laughs> and if you're my daughter, I will make sure that our house is in the, I will buy the hospital because of you. You will be occupying a room in the emergency room. I have an appointment tomorrow. 
Because why? They could have an attack. And let's say you live 10 miles away from the hospital and you're caught in traffic, you could die in the car. Or if you go to Las Vegas and you have no means of, there's, is there a hospital between Barstow and Vegas? There's none. So if Brandy goes there or who, the people are asthmatic, is it, is it recommended that you drive by yourself on, on a car? On a hot day with all the dust? <laughs> and you try to dial 911? I'm having an asthmatic attack. My, my, my algorithm doesn't work. My EpiPen doesn't work. What do I do now? Die. Right. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Because why? You were crazy. You were told with Dr. Gamo not to travel by yourself. Now, if you travel with people, what can those other people do? Nothing. You will still die. <laughs> I suggest, again, if you were my kids, I would buy an emergency, what? An ambulance. It's like a Las Vegas style of ambulance, you know? All the amenities. You have a movie there. We have, a, what, we have all the oxygen tank. <laughs> we have a, a laryngoscope. And I have to be there with you all the time. So I will perform the in, <laughs> intubate you. <laughs> in, intubate and then what? We have a ventilator inside an ambulance. I have to be ready to take care of my kids, see? Eh? Can you imagine? I have a built-in ventilator, a breathing machine. I have a, oh my God, that means you will never die in my presence. Okay? So what is the opposite? So here, Stomach acid will be what? Decrease, stomach acid will be what? Because of the effect of the vagus nerve. Okay? Now, sense organs, we essentially have what? The eye and the ear, right? In the eye, when you wear a contact lens, you put the first layer, what will be the first thing that will hit by the contact lens? First layer. Your cornea. Okay? Then you have what? What do you find after the cornea? You have the aqueous what? Fluid, right? And then the light passes to where? So if you were to draw the, I'm not a good drawer of the eye, but let's see what I can do, okay? So if this were the eye, like this, sagittal plane, view, side view, the first layer would be what? Cornea, right? Right, okay. And then what comes next would be what? The chamber where you have what? Okay, here's what? Your bar? Right? And then you have what? What do you call that muscle that's found here? Iris. Iris? Is the iris a muscle? Yes. yes? So you have what? A case humor here, a case humor, anterior chamber, posterior chamber, and then what's next? The lens, right? And what attaches the lens here? Ciliary what? Muscle or body, which has the zonules, right? Now the lens, is, is it transparent or is it white? Transparent. The aqueous tumor is here. When the light penetrates here, the first thing it hits will be what? Cornea, aqueous tumor passes to what? The iris regulates the size of your what? Pupil, right? So the myris muscle has two parts, dilator and what? Constrictor. Now, what are the two muscles that you find inside the eyeball? Iris and then what? Ciliary muscle. They're called intraocular what? Eye muscles. What do you mean by that? Inside the eyeball. What do you call extraocular? Outside. Outside. The, the six rectus and obliques. They were considered what? Extraocular. Superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. Extra means outside the eyeball, over here. We saw that in the model upstairs. What do you intraocular? Intra means inside. This and this. These are two muscles found there. Now, which one gave the color to your eye? Because it's pigmented. How many of you here have blue eyes? Nobody has blue eyes here? Okay. You have no blue eyes? You have blue eyes? Okay, confirm if it's really blue. Yeah. There we go, it's blue. Yeah. It's not contact lens. <laughs> How many of you have green eyes here? Is it blue or green? Green. 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 Are you sure? Okay. You? Check. Is it really green? Okay. Is it not contact lens? Okay, what about you? What's the color of your eye? Brown? Who has black eyes here? Black eye. <laughs> 
I think mine is black and brown, okay? Just like my brown, beautiful, exotic skin, you know? <laughs> Can you imagine if I was born with blue eyes, with blonde hair, what do you think my father would say? I am not your father! <laughs> but because my father has brown, black eyes, with brown skin, I am the son of my father and the son of my mother. Okay? Now, so the iris gives the color to your eye. It will dilate when you are what? In a dark room. The pupil will constrict when you are what? In a bright, bright lighter room like this, right? Okay? Again, sympathetic, dilate, parasympathetic, constrict. Now, what you find behind the lens would be what? Vitreous what? Humor or body. So this aqueous humor, vitreous humor, vitreous, they are all what? Gel-like, gel-like, you know, liquid to maintain the shape of the eye. At the back, you have the what? The retina. Okay. Now, what do you call the white portion of the eye? The sclera. The sclera is the white portion of the eye. And you have your choroid. And then, of course, the retina has kinds of, what do you call the photoreceptor? Rods and? Okay. Which one is for color vision? Which one is for bright light? Okay. Which one is for dim light? Which one is for night vision? Of course, rod. That's why right, night vision. Dim light, rods. Bright light, color vision, comes. Who among you is color blind here? If you are color blind, most likely you have problems with your combs. And if you are color blind, you cannot join, I believe, the Air Force or part of the military that requires what? Good vision, because can you imagine hitting the airplane and you're color blind and you're hitting the blue with the red? It's enemy, and instead of enemy, you're hitting the friendly forces. So nobody is color blind here? You're very good. Now, of course, so I will not go into the details of the eye, just the rods and cones, the receptors. There is an area here that's important, okay? The blind spot is where the optic disc is found, right? Optic disc, blind spot. Where do you find just purely cones, which is essentially the area of greatest vision? The macula. What? The macula. Huh? Fovia centralis. Fovia centralis, very good. How did you know? In the book. Oh, I love this book. I love this book. Fovia centralis, F-O-V-E-A-C-E-N-T-R-A-L-I-S. Fovia central, centralis. It contains purely cones. It's the area of greatest visual sensitivity. Now, how many of you here are nearsighted? Nearsighted. I think most of us wearing glasses like me, right? Okay. When you're nearsighted, it's called myopia, right? You're near what? Nearsighted means for me to see, I have to go what? Go near, close. I am nearsighted. Why? Because I have a long what? A long eyeball. We were gifted by God. Said, okay, you have a long eyeball. Unfortunately, for those who are far sighted, they have shorter eyeballs. Not because whoever created you did not want you to have a long eyeball, but what is the opposite of myopia? Hyperopia. Here, long eyeball. Here, what? Short. Okay? In other words, if this is a source of light, okay? If the long eyeball extends all the way here, the uh, problem is that the, the, the center, I think it's in the book where you need a pair of what? Glasses like this, right? So I wear the glasses, guess what? Here, no, blurred. With the glasses, I can see. Because you have to have a pair of glasses to correct the error of refraction. What is refraction? Bending of light. Now let's go to the ear. In the ear, you have inner ear, then what? Middle ear, then what? In, inner ear, middle ear, and external ear. Here, what do you call this part of the ear? Auricle or pina. And then you have your what? External auditory canal or ear canal. And from the ear canal, the sound waves penetrate what you call that tympanic membrane is your eardrum. And then because of the air or the sound waves entering, the sound waves entering the eardrum, causing it to vibrate, what will be the next? Structure in the middle ear. In the middle ear, you have the three bones. In the middle ear, malleus, incus, and then what? So the first would be malleus, 
it will vibrate too. Then incus, it will vibrate too. Then what? Stapes or stape, it will also vibrate. Then hits the oval window, and then cause the fluid there to move, remember? All the fluid, the endolymph and the parent will move, and then which, where, where do you find the organ of corti, C-O-R-T-I, it's in the what? Letter C. Cochlea or cochlea, let's say a snail. And what is the nerve? Vestibular what? Cochlear nerve. Now, what is important for balance or equilibrium? The vestibule. Remember the word vestibule there? That's why it's called vestibular cochlear nerve, right? The vestibule contains your utricle and saccule. And you're reading, you probably saw that. Utricle and saccule. And that is for what? What kind of equilibrium would be the vestibule for? Static, what is static equilibrium? When I'm sitting right now or standing right now, even though I'm not moving, which means static, I can I still maintain my balance? Yes. What about if you ride a roller coaster or when you're a ballerina? What do you need? The semicircular canal. So what is the semicircular canal for? Dynamic what? Equilibrium. Needed for those people who, you know, the, the dancers. You know? The ballet dancers and these people who competition on the Olympics, they turn around as well. How is it that they're able to maintain their balance? Because of what? The semicircular canal. So which one is important for dynamic equilibrium? Semicircular canal. Which one is for static equilibrium, just sitting or standing? Vestibule, made up of the utricle, U-R-T-I-C-L-E, and the saccule for static equilibrium. And of course, the cranial nerve involved will be what? Cranial nerve number eight, which happens to be what? Vestibular cochlear nerve, right? So apparently the vestibular cochlear nerve has two components. Cochlear for hearing, organ of corti, sense of hearing. What about for equilibrium? Vestibular. But actually it did also involve the semicircular canal. Vestibular cochlear nerve is cranial nerve number eight. Do you understand? Okay. Vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, what is the receptor? In the eye, it was rods and cones. In the ear, what is it? What am I pointing to? The hair cells. The hair cells, of course. Can I do that during an exam? No. Hair cell, right? Do you understand? Okay. Is that clear? Okay, I'm going to give you a few minutes to have a go to the restroom, drink a cup of Coke or coffee. After what, we will have our quiz, okay? <laughs> 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 <laughs>